Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Thank you for coming. Um, thanks for joining for a quantitative seminar. I am Amelia Duvall, and I'm one of the organizers of this year's quantitative seminar series for the Converse Lab. And I will begin our seminar today with a land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which, which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Our lab also acknowledges that we live and work on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. And today I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, Olivia Sanderfoot, who will, will be presenting um, her work, Detecting Birds in Hazy Skies, the Effect of Air Pollution on Bird Observations. And Dr. Sanderfoot is a newly minted PhD in the Quantitative Ecology Lab at the University of Washington School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. In her research, Dr. Sanderfoot uses community science data and field measurements to study how urban air pollution and wildfire smoke impact birds and other wildlife. In addition to her PhD, she holds two degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, including a Bachelor of Science in Biology, Spanish, and Environmental Studies, and a Master's degree in Environmental Science. Dr. Sanderfoot is driven by her passion for environmental policy and conservation her love for birds, and her strong belief in the Wisconsin idea, the philosophy that a university's research should be applied to solve problems and improve the health, well-being, and environment of the community it serves. She's been interviewed about her research by National Geographic, Discover Magazine, Audubon Magazine, The Seattle Times, The Washington Post, and several local radio and TV stations. Her letters to the editor and op-eds appear in the New York Times and the Spokesman's Review. Dr. Sanderfoot received the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship in 2016 and was named to the University of Washington Husky 100 in 2020. And so today, Olivia will take questions after the talk, but feel free to send them through during the talk with the Q&A feature. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. And thank you to our speaker. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Olivia. Thank you so much, Amelia. Can you still uh, see and hear me okay on your end? Yep, you're all set. Great, awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to share some of the work that I did as part of my PhD in the Quantitative Ecology Lab here at the University of Washington uh, with my advisor, Dr. Beth Gardner. I'm still not used to <laughs> being referred to as Dr. Sanderfoot, um, so it was quite a treat for me to um, be introduced with my new, my new title today, so I'm pretty excited about that. All right, so uh, with that, I will dive right in. I would also like to share uh, my own land acknowledgement that's a bit more specific to my research. Uh, I respectfully acknowledge that I am on the traditional land of Coast Salish peoples, including the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, who have stewarded the land where I live and work for thousands of years. I would also like to acknowledge that my research includes studies of birds and other wildlife in and beyond Washington State on lands that intersect with hundreds of unceded indigenous territories. This land acknowledgement is one small act in the ongoing process of reconciliation and sustainable just management of these lands and the resources they provide. So today I'll provide a brief overview um, of some of the work that I did in my PhD. I'll provide an introduction, um, just thinking about how we, uh, what we know about how air pollution impacts birds. And then we're going to spend some time on two questions. The first question is, how does wildfire smoke affect detection of birds? And we tackle this uh, using two different approaches. Um, one, building generalized linear mixed models using community science data, and two, using linear mixed models um, to look at uh, the relationship between audio recordings and soundscapes and uh, measures of air quality. And in the second question, we're gonna think about a different kind of air pollution. Instead of thinking about wildfire smoke, we're gonna think about urban air pollution. Um, and at the end of this talk, I hope to convince you that um, these three different approaches tell us that air pollution is an important component of the detection process, and it's something that we should be thinking about when modeling population demographics. So 
there's a lot to cover in 45 minutes. Uh, I will be happy to take questions at the end. Um, and in the meantime, if you want to put uh, ideas in the chat so you don't forget, that's absolutely fine. Um, I won't look at it, but I'm really excited to take questions um, at the end. So, birds and other wildlife face myriad threats including habitat loss from urbanization, and climate change, pollution, invasive species, and overexploitation. And air pollution is also a known risk to birds, but air quality for a long, long time has been overlooked in conservation biology and wildlife management. We just tend not to think too much about how air pollution is impacting birds. Now, air pollution poses both direct and indirect effects um, and both of these together influence demographic rates that could ultimately have population level impacts for bird populations. And I want to dig in a little bit here and explain what these direct and indirect effects look like. So birds are more susceptible to air pollution than other types of animals. And if there's one thing that I'd love everyone to take away from this talk today, it is this idea that of all taxa, birds are likely most vulnerable to poor air quality. And this is because of the unique structure of the respiratory system. Birds exhibit unidirectional airflow, and this allows them to extract more oxygen per unit volume of air inhaled than we do. So when we breathe, we breathe in and out. Everyone can practice this at home and take a deep breath. So when we breathe in, our lungs expand, we bring in air, uh, gas exchange takes place in our lungs and we push out that uh, stale air um, on, that second, uh, on that second exhale. But birds actually breathe in one continuous loop and this allows them to be really, really good at respiration, but unfortunately also makes them more vulnerable to toxic compounds in the air that they breathe. Furthermore, they seem to lack some of the same mechanisms that we use to clear particles from the airway. So whether we're talking about gaseous air pollutants or particulate air pollutants, birds are just more vulnerable to the toxic stuff that's in the air that we breathe. Now, even though research on air pollution impacts in birds is limited, there have been some health effects, some direct effects established, including immunosuppression, respiratory illness, stress, and behavioral changes, as well as impaired reproductive success. So these things aren't so good for birds. In addition, air pollution also indirectly impacts birds by altering habitat. For example, wildfire smoke impairs visibility and ground level ozone damages the leaf tissue of plants and reduces crop yields. Furthermore, emissions from industrial and agricultural sites can lead to atmospheric deposition of sulfuric and nitric acids, which results in the acidification of lakes and rivers which damages freshwater habitats and adversely impacts birds and other wildlife who call these places home. So to recap, we know that birds are more vulnerable to air pollution than other types of animals, and this is due to the unique structure of the respiratory system. This leads to direct health effects. And while those are in play, air pollution is also changing habitats in a way that could indirectly impact birds. And together, these direct and indirect effects could lead to shifts in demographic rates that ultimately influence populations. But a lot of those pathways at this point are more or less just hypothesized in the literature because we don't have the information that we need to really build out um, the, the details along those mechanistic uh, hypotheses. So the limited inference that we have really prohibits us from characterizing impacts on wild free living birds and the sensitivity of responses to specific air pollutants. Um, so we might know something about how heavy metal or how ozone influences one bird in a captive setting, but that's not gonna tell us a whole lot about how ozone concentrations uh, in a specific region impact um, a community of birds. There's a lot of work to be done um, to get us to the point where we can characterize dose response relationships for specific species and specific pollutants. Um, and what I would really love to see us get to is, is modeling demographic rates as a function of air pollution. But we have a lot of work to do to make that happen. And the studies that we need are challenging to design and costly to implement. And with so little research conducted to date, it's difficult to know where to start. So to advance this research agenda, I propose that we think more critically about how air pollution simply affects detection of birds. In other words, 
In my PhD, I really wanted to explore how our observations of birds change when it is hazy or smoggy. Because if our observations of birds change under different air quality conditions, that could tell us something super valuable about how air pollution is affecting the health and behavior of birds and tell us something about which species and communities are most at risk. Essentially, I am looking for the <laughs> signal and the noise. Uh, if there is a change in detection of birds as a function of air quality, um, I think characterizing that is a really important and valuable first step into telling us more about air pollution impacts across a wide range of species. Now, there are a lot of air pollutants that we could consider, but in my PhD, I decided to focus specifically on fine particulate matter, which refers to all the suspended liquid and solid particles less than 2.5 microns in diameter. So this is the tiny, tiny stuff in the air that can become deeply embedded in the respiratory system. This diagram shows, um, it compares the, the size of PM2.5 to sand and human hair, and you can see that PM2.5 is actually smaller than the width of the human hair. So this stuff is very, very fine. There are both biogenic and anthropogenic sources of PM2.5. Um, for example, PM2.5 um, is present in windblown dust, and it's also a component of exhaust from vehicles. And Regardless of where it comes from, it does pose a major risk to public health. Um, PM2.5 has been linked to cardiovascular and respiratory disease, and it is responsible for 4.2 million premature deaths every year. So it's a big deal for public health. So um, because of that, there are lots and lots of amazing data sets out there um, to help folks characterize exposure to this pollutant. Um, we have exposure estimates from ground-based monitors, air quality models, and satellite instruments, and all of these rich data sets provide a great source of information for us as ecologists to think more about what uh, air pollution exposure looks like for animals. So, because we know that PM2.5 is a big deal for public health, we know that it's been linked to a number of adverse health impacts in humans, and there's a lot of great data out there to help us uh, consider PM2.5 exposure for wildlife. I consider this to be a great um, pollutant to focus on um, to get this research started. Furthermore, PM2.5 is also a major component of wildfire smoke. And as we are all aware, uh, climate change and the legacy of fire suppression are both driving an increase in the frequency, intensity, and severity of wildfires. Um, so PM2.5 is becoming more and more of a problem every year. Uh, in fact, uh, smoke could be considered uh, an issue that exceeds the geographic scale of wildfires themselves because it can blow hundreds to thousands of miles from the locations of fires. This is um, satellite imagery taken on September 9th, 2020, um, along the west coast of North America. And you can see that smoke from fires in British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon are blowing hundreds of miles out to sea. Um, so if we think about all of the birds that live in this space, PM2.5 is certainly something that they are all experiencing. So this brings me to part one of today's seminar. We're, we're gonna think a little bit about how does wildfire smoke affect detection of birds? Um, and the goal of the two studies together that I'll present is to really help us think more about how wildfire smoke is changing our observations of birds and what that could mean for wildlife. So more specifically, in this first study, we ask, does wildfire smoke impact the probability of observing birds? Um, or more specifically, how did PM2.5 as a marker of wildfire smoke during the wildfire season affect the probability of observing birds in Washington state from 2015 to 2018? And the results of this research were um, published in ornithological applications earlier this year. So we hypothesized that wildfire smoke would lead to behavioral changes in birds that could ultimately influence their presence and or detection. And because of that, we expected to see a shift in the probability of observing birds when it was smoky. So some behavioral changes that birds might exhibit due to wildfire smoke could be reduced vocalization, reduced movement, um, or alternatively, perhaps agitation, 
or um, a shift in um, how they're using habitat. Um, we can talk more about the specific behavioral responses that we might hypothesize in the Q&A, um, but we can imagine that if birds are changing their behavior because it is smoky, that that could change if they are present in a place and if they are detected. And either way, that would influence our probability of observing them. The detection piece of this is important though, because detection is also dependent on us as human observers. So. Um, if wildfire smoke is influencing our ability to detect birds, we would be picking up on that too, just by focusing on the probability of observing birds as a response variable. For example, we might feel unwell, it might be um, pretty difficult to see when it's smoky, and that could negatively impact our ability to observe birds. So ultimately in the study, we wanted to look at whether or not PM 2.5 as a marker of smoke pollution influenced the probability of observing birds. And we expected that we would observe this relationship and that it would be positive for some species and negative for others. So to answer this research question, we used data submitted to eBird, a global semi-structured citizen science program. And we relied on 62,908 eBird checklists from 4,865 observers. Um, and the locations of those checklists are shown as gray dots on this map. We also relied on data on PM 2.5 from the Environmental Protection Agency Air Quality System, and the locations of the monitors included in this analysis are shown as black triangles on this map. So you can see that we covered um, a wide range of habitats on um, public and private land across Washington state, but the majority of our sites were concentrated in um, highly populated urban centers. We also relied on data um, on land cover from the 2016 National Land Cover Database and data on weather from the North American Regional Reanalysis. We decided to focus on two variables related to weather, specifically the daily mean air temperature and the daily accumulated precipitation at checklist locations. So we focused the analysis on 71 species commonly observed in 2015. And we did this because we wanted to um, look at a wide range of species because we expected again that the probability of observing birds would be different um, depending on the species themselves um, but we also wanted to make sure that we had enough sightings to sufficiently uh, fit our models so that's why we focused on the, these top uh, most commonly observed species and in this analysis we used generalized linear mixed models with a binomial distribution to model the probability of observing each of our study species during the 2015 through 2018 wildfire seasons. So we pulled data across those four years and we determined how the probability of observing birds was related to a number of fixed effects. Um, so in this analysis, it's, it's important to keep in mind that the probability of observing a bird is a reflection of both the probability that it is a present and the probability that it is detected given that it is present. So we have to think about availability and perceptibility in addition to whether or not a species actually occurs in a given location. So in this, in our models, we included a number of fixed effects. Uh, we included a fixed effect of year because we expected that yearly changes in populations would ultimately influence detection of birds. We included land cover class as a fixed effect because we expected that birds would use different habitats. And we also included a number of temporal predictors, including day of year, day of year squared, and time of day to get at how the probability of observing birds changes over time and um, over the course of a day. We expected there to be seasonal variation in populations as well as diurnal variation in activity that influenced the probability of observing birds. We also included survey duration as a fixed effect, as well as distance traveled, because we expected that folks that went birding for longer periods of time or over further distances would observe more birds than folks who conducted shorter surveys at shorter distances. Finally, we included fixed effects of temperature, precipitation, and PM 2.5, because we really wanted to think about how air pollution influences detection, but we wanted to account for other environmental factors, um, other weather variables um, that ultimately could also influence detection. So in essence, we're controlling for all of the things that we think could influence where birds are and whether or not they're observed. And then we're also considering air pollution. 
In addition, we included a random effective observer in our models because we expected that some birders would be better, better than others at detecting certain species. So what did we find? Well, uh, we found that PM2.5 influenced the probability of observing 37% of study species, including raptors, water birds, and songbirds, which is rather remarkable because we are already accounting for so many fixed effects. So to see a statistically significant effect of PM2.5 really tells us something valuable about this additional impact of air pollution on top of um, effects that we tend to already consider in models. Uh, this relationship was negative for 16 species and positive for 10 species. And we believe that this suggests that um, the response can't be explained by impacts on human observers alone. If we only saw a negative effect of PM2.5 on the probability of observing birds, it would be really difficult to say for certain that something was actually happening to birds because we can think of a lot of reasons why our detection of birds would be impaired when it is smoky. As I mentioned, we might feel sick, we might not be able to see as far because visibility has been degraded by wildfire smoke. And if that's the case, then we would only see a negative relationship between detection and PM2.5. But the fact that we see some positive effects um, suggests to us that something else is going on here. So um, as I, just mentioned, uh, we saw that as the daily mean concentration of PM2.5 increased, we actually were more readily able to detect uh, 10 bird species, including the cedar waxwing, red-breasted nuthatch, spotted towhee, and a number of other smaller songbirds. Um, we also saw that this effect was positive for all of the warblers included in our study species, which we thought was interesting. Uh, so, what we're seeing here is that many small songbirds and birds spotted at ground level were actually um, more readily detected at higher levels of air pollution during these smoke events. Um, and we think one of the reasons for this could be that birds were maybe forced to spend more time uh, at ground level because they couldn't see as far, or maybe as the larger predator species left the study area, um, they were able to be more active. But it's also possible that human observers were focusing more of their, their birding efforts at ground level because they couldn't see as far. So this is helping us think about which taxa and which kinds of birds might be most impacted by PM2.5. We also found that PM2.5 uh, decreased the probability of observing 16 species. This is a plot showing the predicted probability of observing birds as a function of the daily mean concentration of PM2.5 for those species that exhibited a negative relationship. And we can see on this list that there were a number of larger water birds, including great blue heron and, and several gull species, as well as um, large birds of prey um, included in this list. So this suggests to us that um, certainly we can't rule out the fact that if we're not able to see as far as PM2.5 ticks up, that it might be harder to see birds that are typically spotted at a distance, like gulls and hawks. But at the same time, um, it does seem likely that um, there are some behavioral responses in play here. There are a couple of smaller birds on this list as well, such as the marsh wren. Um, the marsh wren, at least I typically detect the marsh wren um, by ear. So if birds are vocalizing less, um, it might be harder to detect species like the marsh wren. So a big take home point, um, at least for this lecture today for a group of folks really interested in, in quantitative analyses is that the effect of PM2.5 on the probability of observing birds is actually greater than the effect of rainfall or temperature for several species. This is a plot showing the effect size of all of the fixed effects um, across our 71 models. And at the far right, you can see the range of effect sizes for PM2.5. And it does overlap with the effect sizes for um, temperature and precipitation. So one of the things that um, our team is really uh, hoping to make the case for with this study is that excluding air pollution can actually bias studies of bird populations um, because we're not accounting for a really important component of the detection process. So key findings from this first approach are that 
wildfire smoke certainly seems to influence the presence, availability, and or perceptibility of birds. And teasing out the mechanisms behind this response was behind this, the, was beyond the scope of this study. Um, but there's something going on here that's worthy of further exploration. And we think that the relationship between PM 2.5 and the probability of observing birds is likely explained at least in part by species specific behavioral responses. Um, furthermore, these patterns of detection, they can help guide future study. We're starting to see where birds group together, which kinds of species are really, are, we see more or less often when it is smoky. And by grouping them, we can start to figure out what these, um, what the mechanisms behind this response are. And finally, this demonstrates that ecologists should really consider incorporating air pollution when modeling detection. It seems to be, at least for some species, just as important, if not more important, than other commonly considered variables, such as temperature and rainfall and time of day. So in the next, uh, the next study that we're working on, we're trying to dig into those, those mechanisms. We're trying to figure out why we might have seen this shift in the probability of observing birds when it is smoky. And research today has suggested that both mammalian and avian vocalization could decline during smoke pollution episodes. And as I mentioned earlier, that could be one kind of behavioral response that ultimately drives shifts in detection. And we can use acoustic data to learn more about these changes in avian activity that are triggered by particle pollution during smoke events. Um, we are very lucky in that our team has access to um, several hundred bioacoustics recorders, and these recorders are increasingly used to monitor wildlife because they are low cost and very, very easy to use in the field. Um, so because of that, it's, it's, it's easy to get a lot of data on avian activity really quickly. And we leveraged this to build a data set that allowed us to think a little bit more critically about um, song birds and bird song as a behavioral response during wildfire smoke events. Um, so analyzing audio data is no easy task. Uh, soundscapes can be very complicated. And just to give folks kind of a sense of how we go about analyzing audio data, I thought I would um, play for you the call of a house sparrow um, and show you the spectrogram for that call. So this is a plot of the frequency versus time for the call of the house sparrow. Um, and so I hope you'll be able to hear this on your end. Uh, Amelia and I actually didn't test this, so hopefully it'll work. Oh, I don't think you're gonna be able to hear that through my headphones. Oh, wow. So you can imagine, cheep, 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 cheep. That aligns with the spectrogram. And what is uh, good about that is it we basically have a visualization of the sound. And this is what fuels a lot of ecoacoustics study. So we go out in the field, we collect a great deal of audio data, we visualize it in these spectrograms, and we can feed the spectrograms into algorithms um, that tell us something about the wildlife that the recordings have picked up. And this is super useful because this is a spectrogram for the call of just one bird. But in the wild, we hear lots and lots of birds and we hear traffic noise and wind and, and all sorts of things. And so if spectrograms are very rarely that simple, we need a, a way to quickly get useful information from them. And so uh, ecoacoustic indices have been developed, um, dozens of them, to evaluate specific features of soundscapes that relate to a component of wildlife activity. So for example, the normalized different soundscape index was developed to provide a ratio of non-human to anthropogenic activity. So you can compute the NDSI and get an idea of how much of the soundscape is dominated by um, human activity and how much is dominated by wildlife. The Acoustic Diversity Index tells us something about species biodiversity. This is a proxy measurement that works very similarly to the Shannon's Diversity Index, but rather than think about um, the number of species and the counts of species, we think about the number of voices calling in different frequency bands within a soundscape. Um, I'm focusing my analyses on two of these um, indices, specifically the Acoustic Complexity Index and the Bioacoustic Index, which have been shown to be excellent proxies for avian vocalization, so frequency of bird song, and uh, bird abundance. So these indexes are all built using spectrograms. Um, so they're very difficult to build from a computational perspective. They simply just they take a lot of time. Um, but if you can get a bunch of audio data 
and have the computer build spectrograms, you feed those spectrograms into a script that computes the indexes based on the spectrograms. And then it's easy to look at those values, get a snapshot for how avian activity or other types of wildlife activity are varying um, in your audio recordings. So we use this approach to think about how vocalization as a specific avian behavior could be influenced by smoke. So our overarching research question is, how does wildfire smoke influence bird vocalization and other features of the acoustic environment? And we're specifically zooming in on the ACI, that acoustic complexity index, and the bioacoustic index during the 2019 wildfire season in rural areas in Eastern Washington. So we hypothesized that wildfire smoke would depress bird vocalization, and that in turn would lead to a decrease in those two acoustic indices used to monitor bird activity. And therefore, there would be a negative effect of PM2.5 as a marker of wildfire smoke on those indices. So to answer this research question, uh, to dig into this, we relied on bioacoustics data our team collected as part of the Washington Predator-Prey Project. And uh, we were deployed uh, these audio moths at 87 monitoring sites in two study areas in the summer of 2019. And they were programmed to capture the dawn core, so the time of day that typically is considered to be um, most uh, active for birds. Uh, we also characterized microhabitat in the field. We determined if a site was forested or not, riparian or not, and also estimated the percent canopy cover. And uh, in addition to these microhabitat features, we also pulled data on elevation at our study sites from the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission Digital Elevation Model. So we have this audio data, we've characterized habitat, now we have to think about where we're gonna get the air pollution data from. And we were able to work with uh, Washington State University's Laboratory for Atmospheric Research to get data on PM2.5 from AirPact, the Air Indicator Report for Public Awareness and Community Tracking. And this, uh, this data is from an air quality model. So it's a different approach to characterizing PM2.5 than we used uh, earlier. Um, in the study of eBird data, we pulled data on air quality from ground-based monitors, and in this approach, we're actually pulling data from an air quality model. Um, in addition to these daily estimates of PM2.5 from AirPact, we also relied on weather data from NAR, the North American Regional Reanalysis. So in this analysis, we built linear mix models to assess the correlation between daily mean PM2.5 concentrations and daily values of those acoustic indices. And we used a number of fixed effects to characterize habitat, knowing that habitat would ultimately influence the presence of birds and therefore vocalization picked up on by our monitors. And we also included day and day squared because we wanted to account for seasonal variation in bird activity. Uh, in addition, we included fixed effects of temperature, precipitation, and PM2.5 to consider how weather and air quality influence um, bird song. So just like with the eBird study, in this study, we're thinking about what could influence habitat, how seasonality could influence bird activity, and how weather could influence bird activity, and then we're layering on top of that PM2.5. And the focus of our inference is really on the statistical significance and direction of that PM2.5 covariate. Um, in addition, in this analysis, we included a random effective site because we um, knew that there would be other differences from site to site um, that we needed to capture. Uh, so what did we find? We, we did find that there is spatial and temporal variation in acoustic activity, um, specifically avian acoustic activity across both of our study sites. But what was really interesting to us is that the relationship between the indices and the fixed effects did vary by study area, even though our study areas are really close together and similar in a lot of ways, which suggests that there is a lot of uh, variation potentially in wildlife acoustic activity and birdsong, even uh, between sites uh, that are located very close together. Uh, we found that weather, but not PM2.5, influenced avian acoustic activity. So this is not quite what we expected to find, but it's worth bearing in mind that the air quality in our study area was good in, a, in the summer of 2019. In fact, the air quality never uh, exceeded the national ambient air quality standards 
on any of the days included in our analysis at any of the sites included in our analysis. So we didn't really get at smoke. Even though we considered air pollution, we didn't really get at smoke. So what this tells us is when air quality is good, day-to-day um, -day changes in PM2.5 don't seem to impact bird song when we've accounted for habitat and seasonality and weather in these particular study areas. Um, we did observe um, evidence of seasonality in birdsong, which we expected. Those linear and quadratic effects of day of year were very important for both indices of avian activity. Uh, we did have our bioacoustics recorders out in 2020 during that large scale smoke event um, that I'm sure we all remember. Um, and so we are very excited to build the 2020 data into these models. I am working on that now. Um, and hopefully that'll give us a better understanding of how bird song changes when it's actually smoky, not just when PM 2.5 is varying by a little bit um, day after day in these rural areas. Um, to give you a sense for how different air quality was, this is a plot showing the daily mean concentration of PM 2.5 during um, 2019. You can see that for the most part, air quality is quite good. And this is what the daily mean concentration of PM 2.5 looked like in 2020. And that massive spike aligns with the large scale smoke event that we experienced in late summer. And um, it's worth remembering that the, the limit set by the EPA is 35 micrograms per cubic meter. And that top peak is at above 750. So we're gonna get a lot more range in our PM 2.5 covariate um, for the second step of our analysis. In addition, we think it will be important to account for other sources of geophony, such as wind and vehicle traffic. So, whirlwind, I know, looking at the clock. So I'm <laughs> covering three studies in this seminar, which is perhaps a bit ambitious, and I'm happy to circle back with any questions. We don't have time to cover them, always around via email um, or phone, so we can set up a time to chat. Um, but I also want to provide some insight into our findings looking at PM2.5 from a different source. So in part two of this talk, I'm going to very quickly um, go over what we found about how urban air pollution affects detection of birds. So the last two studies, the eBird study, the bioacoustic study, that tells us something about how detection of birds is changing as a function of wildfire smoke. And we're using PM2.5 as a marker of that. Um, and now we're going to think about PM2.5 in urban air pollution. So this is important because PM2.5 varies quite a bit in its biological and chemical composition based on its source. And wildfire smoke is considered to be incredibly toxic. Um, and urban air pollution is also toxic, but less so. And the odor and visibility issues and health effects change depending on that composition. So we, when we're thinking about air pollution and its effect on wildlife and detection, we can't just think about um, the, the pollutant uh, as, a, as a number, <laughs> even though that's our jam in a quantitative group. Uh, we actually have to think about what that number means. And in this case, um, it can mean very different things in terms of toxicity and um, how the environment for animals is changing. So we have to think about sources of air pollution and not just concentration. So we have a lot of work to do in that realm as well. So urbanization transforms the environment. As we move from rural to urban areas, we see the percent impervious surface increase. We see more light pollution, more noise pollution, and we see more urban air pollution, um, especially from vehicle exhaust. And What's difficult is that sometimes light, noise, and or air pollution are correlated. So it's hard to tease out in a highly urban environment which component of urbanization is impacting birds and other wildlife. And it occurred to us that during the COVID-19 pandemic and the lo subsequent lockdowns that rapid changes in human behavior in cities were changing some pieces of uh, urbanization, but not others. So we have the urban matrix set as it is, but as human activity changes, light, noise, and air pollution um, could be impacted. And so we had this unique opportunity to tease out how different components of urbanization influence birds and really think about how air pollution um, is driving changes in the detection of birds in urban spaces. So um, we wanted to answer the question, 
how did air pollution and human activity affect detection of birds during COVID-19 lockdown? And we hypothesized that during lockdowns, we would see a decline in human activity, which would lead to a decline in vehicle and air traffic, which would influence noise and air pollution. And because of that, the presence and or detection of birds. And human activity itself could also directly influence the presence and or detection of birds. Um, and there are a lot of really cool results from this study I'm about to share, but I'll try to focus most on that link between air pollution and detection. So to answer this question, we started the UW Lockdown Birding Study. Um, this was a data collection blitz that was launched through eBird to help us monitor birds in the Pacific Northwest in the spring of 2020. We invited folks to submit complete stationary 10 minute uh, point count checklists. So they went out and they surveyed birds and recorded all the birds that they could see and hear in 10 minutes and then submitted the checklists, the documentation of their sightings um, as, um, as notes to eBird. And we asked folks to do this on a weekly basis from April 1st to June 30th. And shockingly, more than 900 people enrolled in this program, which is just unbelievably fabulous. Um, we're really excited to have had such phenomenal support from our community for this effort. So our goals were to explore bird distributions within a complex urban matrix. The Pacific Northwest is a really interesting place because we've all got all these amazing pockets of green space and beautiful parks, but we also have a lot of heavily urbanized and heavily industrialized areas. So we wanted to think about um, where those 900 volunteers were located, what their monitoring sites looked like, and how that influenced which birds were present um, at their locations. We also wanted to specifically evaluate the effect of air pollution on detection of birds. And we uh, thought that this approach would allow us to dig into that while also thinking about which birds might have been most affected by changes in human activity during lockdowns. Finally, um, for me, another huge goal of the study was just to engage folks in scientific research and get people excited about birding because the more people who are on board um, for conserving birds, the more likely we are to actually meet that goal. So uh, we got a lot of data from this study. Our final data set includes 6,640 eBird checklists at 429 monitoring sites from 376 observers in Washington and Oregon. Um, and I can get into our filtering process and why not all of our um, volunteers' data were included in the final data set um, if folks are interested. The location of those checklists are, is shown in the map at right. And together, our volunteers contributed hundreds of hours and observed 193 species, which is just a tremendous effort. Um, in addition to those checklists, we also invited our volunteers to participate in an online questionnaire to get more information about their monitoring sites. We were interested in whether or not they had seed or suet feeders available for birds, as well as um, hummingbird feeders and bird baths. And we were interested in this not only because we wanted to think about how those uh, those features attracted birds uh, to various locations within the Pacific Northwest. We also wanted to account for that when thinking about detection. We know that um, feeders uh, attract birds and might increase the probability of detecting birds. And so accounting for that was important. We received 284 responses to the survey. So if we go back to this map, the um, sites shown in blue are sites that we had that additional information for. And this sites shown in black were still included in our analysis, but we were unable to consider how um, those microhabitat features influenced species presence. So um, in addition to this data, we also included data on land cover, um, percent canopy cover, just to account for differences in habitat, data on weather, including the daily mean air temperature and the daily accumulated precipitation, as well as air quality data from the EPA. Again, we're zooming in on that um, daily mean concentration of PM 2.5. We also included data on human activity from the Google Mobility Reports, and this is a really interesting metric. Um, it is the percent change in human mobility from a pre-pandemic baseline. Um, so this is a plot showing the percent change in human mobility at our monitoring sites included in our analysis across our study period. And you can see that we started a negative value because human activity was depressed in April of 2020. 
And by the end of our study period on June 30th, 2020, human activity had ticked up a little bit, but we still were largely below um, what we were at prior to the pandemic. So just to give you a sense of what that covariate looks like. Uh, so in this analysis, we focused on 46 species commonly observed by our volunteers, and we analyzed um, bird observations using single season occupancy models. Um, and I'm so sure folks um, at, at this seminar are familiar with occupancy models, but if you're not, they're cool because they account for imperfect detection while allowing us to evaluate how habitat and other variables influence the presence and detection of a species. Um, because our sites were smaller than home ranges, we interpreted occupancy probability as the probability of site use. So we were really able to think about what drives site use within the urban matrix across our study species. Um, we also interpreted the probability detection as both a reflection of the availability of birds and their perceptibility. So are they available to be observed on a given day? And if so, how likely are we to perceive them? So we included a number of effects on site use, including land cover, percent canopy cover, as well as bird feeders, hummingbird feeders, and bird baths in a secondary analysis using a subset of data at the sites shown in blue on the map. And we included a number of fixed effects on detection, including day of year, time of day, weekend, air temperature, accumulated precipitation, PM 2.5, and percent change in human mobility. So you're seeing a pattern here. We account for habitat, we account for seasonality, we account for time of day and effort, we account for weather, and then we layer air pollution in on top of it. So I don't have time to walk through all of our results on site use, but um, I'm happy to talk with folks offline more about this. A big take home point is that for the most part, feeders and bird baths aren't such a big deal in determining site use, except for Anna's and Rufus hummingbirds, which are definitely attracted to sites with hummingbird feeders. Uh, as we expected, day of year, time of day, and weather were all important predictors of detection, but we did find that PM 2.5 even after accounting for those variables, influenced detection of 22% of study species. And like with that earlier eBird analysis, looking at the impact of wildfire smoke on the probability of observing birds, these effects were positive or negative, which tells us something about how um, PM 2.5 could be influencing bird behavior. And even more importantly, air quality was very good in the Pacific Northwest during COVID-19 lockdown. So we're still seeing this effect at much, much, much lower concentrations of PM 2.5 than we do when it is smoky. We also found that human mobility influenced detection of 76% of study species, and 50% of the study species were actually more likely to be detected as um, human mobility increased, so as lockdown restrictions eased. And we think this could be because our volunteers detected those species more often as the study season progressed, possibly because birds that were in um, areas that maybe are usually um, more heavily occupied by people were pushed into the backyard spaces that our volunteers were monitoring. So key findings from this study, species specific responses were highly variable, which underscores the complexity of bird distributions at fine spatial scales. Air pollution is a super important component of the detection process for at least one fifth of the study species included in this analysis. And that shows that, um, again, even when air quality is good, air pollution is driving the availability and or perceptibility of birds. And I also really enjoyed working on this study because it shows that public participation in science generates incredibly high value data sets that can help us answer exceedingly complex questions. So, in conclusion, air pollution, like weather, influences if and how we observe birds. Analyzing trends in detection is a good first step toward understanding avian responses to air pollution, and there is tremendous potential for interdisciplinary collaborations between ecologists and atmospheric scientists to dig into this. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge my funding from the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program and the McIntyre Stennis Cooperative Forestry Research Program, and I'd like to thank um, the, my phenomenal colleagues in the UW Quantitative Ecology and Quantitative Conservation Labs, as well as our volunteers and bird enthusiasts everywhere. Um, without you, this work would not be possible. And with that, I would love to take any questions. So fast, lots of information in a short amount of time. 
Thank you, Olivia. That was amazing. Yes, and jam packed with um, a ton of information. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so a reminder to all of our participants, um, there is the Q&A feature, and then you're also welcome to raise your hand, and I will do my best to spot your raised hand and then unmute you if you prefer to ask a question um, over the webinar. And while we're waiting for those to come through, I was um, just thinking, Olivia, maybe you could briefly mention the recent study on um, geese that we were kind of talking about at the beginning of the talk. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There is a very interesting um, new study out um, looking at how the migratory patterns of four geese were impacted by heavy wildfire smoke along the west coast during fall migration in 2020. And they found that these geese became incredibly disoriented during their flight. Um, while passing over water, they tended to spend a lot of time floating at sea. Um, when passing over land, they attempted to get up and over the smoke plumes. And all in all, this added hundreds of miles to their journey. They did ultimately end up at the stopover site that they visit every year, um, but it took them longer to get there and they expended obviously more energy to do so. So it's the first study that looks at how wildfire smoke is impacting migration of any species, to my knowledge, certainly in birds. And it really shows that um, both due to potentially health effects, but certainly due to changes in, in visibility and the visual cues that birds depend on, that migration is heavily impacted by smoke events. Yeah, it's pretty interesting how much we still don't know. <laughs> Um, it is. Goes for a lot of things. And do you? I don't see any questions on my end. Just so you know. Yes. No, that's correct. Yeah, I'm taking a peek right now, and I'm looking, um, making sure I'm not missing any raised hands as well. Do you know why the sample size was so small for that study? Was it just what what they were able able to track? Yeah, it sounds like it was part of a long-term monitoring effort. They had some some GPS tags out uh, before the smoke event, and so they leveraged that um, and looked at the birds that they had tagged that did survive to that season mm -hmm. and were in a position where they were migrating south. Um, and so their sample size was was small. And they do acknowledge in the study those folks that um, conducted this research that it is a small sample size, but it's so hard with telemetry studies to get much more than that. Yeah. The plots that they include are, are stunning just to, the, to show the, the, they show the path that the birds took over uh, a vertical distribution of the smoke. And you can see them take these huge um, altitude climbs just in an attempt to evade the smoke, which is, hmm. I mean, from a, from a research perspective, it's fascinating, but obviously it makes me very sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, let's see, um, got one coming in here. So. I will read it out loud. Um, okay, so one question we have is, what would be the dream next step for the citizen science work if you could continue it and expand on it in any form you wish? That's a great question from Stacey. Oh, that's a great question. Okay, I have two right off the bat. One is that our um, study sites are primarily concentrated in affluent neighborhoods. And so I think it would be really important and valuable to extend um, public participation into communities that have been historically uh, not included in community science um, because A, that's important from a community building perspective, but B, it actually allows us to look at the full distribution of birds across the urban matrix rather than focusing um, in places where that, um, that uh, luxury effect is likely in play. So that's one big thing. The other thing is that there are some really, really cool um, remote air quality monitors like Purple Air that I would love to equip our volunteers with. It would be really cool if we had a measurement of air pollution during their studies to directly link air pollution at the time that they're making their bird observations to the detection process because right now we're relying on these daily means from nearby monitors which are good. That's how we do a lot of epidemiological study but we can always do better at getting a more fine um, rigorous exposure estimate. Mm -hmm. Are those fairly expensive uh, units? I can see that being something that people just start bringing into their lives, you know, over time. Yes. Well, the purple air monitors um, that we've looked at are are not cheap, 
Um, but as far as air quality monitors go, they're quite affordable. The, the gold standard air quality monitors that the EPA uses are like not, <laughs> not, yeah. not affordable, but we might be able to get, you know, money to get, you know, 20 folks a uh, purple air at $200 each. And that, that equipment is becoming more and more affordable every year. And there are some cool like personal exposure monitors that you can use and wear too. Um, but this just goes to show too that including atmospheric scientists and epidemiologists in this work will be super valuable because they're the go-to people on which tech works best for these different situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, we got another question here. So your study focused on birds due to how they breathe so efficiently, but I'm curious what you think about how amphibians might be impacted by smoke. That is a great question. Um, since I don't study amphibians, I obviously can't can't wager uh, that good of a guess, but I can say that our team recently conducted a comprehensive literature review looking at the impacts of wildfire smoke on all wildlife, not just birds, and those results um, are published in environmental research letters. That study just came out a couple weeks ago, um, and so you can read what we hope is a comprehensive evaluation of all the research out there on wildfire smoke impacts on wildlife, including amphibians, and we didn't find any studies on amphibians. So uh, I would assume because they breathe through their skin that they're incredibly vulnerable to air pollution, including wildfire smoke. Um, but we don't know of any studies that specifically look at smoke as a pollutant and its effect on amphibians. Um, similarly, there's some research that suggests that cetaceans could be more heavily impacted because of how they breathe. Um, they tend to, I guess, hold in air for longer periods of time so that it increases their efficiency, but um, it makes them more vulnerable to airborne toxins. There's a study, Ven Watson et al. 2013, that looked at how dolphins exposed to smoke fared not well. Um, so something to keep in mind too for fisheries folk. Yeah, I seem to remember watching satellite imagery during these smoke events too, and the smoke travels quite a ways off the coast, correct? So yes. it's not, yeah. Absolutely, it is not just an issue for terrestrial animals. And we, we try to make a, a, a point of calling it out in the review. Any air breathing animal, whether terrestrial or aquatic, could certainly be impacted by wildfire smoke, particularly during extreme events like we saw in 2020, because that smoke just blows for hundreds to thousands of miles. Yeah. Looking for anything else? Well, hopefully, everyone saw your information too. I regret that GoToWebinar doesn't have. A chat feature, but um, I know you shared your contact contact information, and that shouldn't be too hard for people to hunt down either. If they have questions that pop up later, oh, there it is. Yeah, I can show there. I think you can see it now, along with all yeah. my other slides. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So feel free to reach out uh, via email or on Twitter or check out my website. Um, uh, all of our research is posted on our website. Um, at the Quantitative Ecology Lab, as well as on my website. So if you're interested in learning more about what we do. Um, that's a great place to start, and I love chatting with folks and trying to make my case that we should think about air pollution, especially us uh, quantitative folks who are thinking about detection. It's just, it's, it's really important and has not been examined to the extent that I feel that it should. So yeah, yeah, I'm really here about um, once you analyze the results from 2020. Yes, so close. The ecoacoustics indices finally built. It took like three weeks. So I think we're finally at the point that we can add into the model. So maybe I'll have to come back and let you know. Yeah, that happens. sounds great. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for talking with yeah. us. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, this will be recorded and we will be back um, next week. We'll send out more information about next week's talk on Monday. Sounds so, good. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye, everyone.